And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Two Guys in a Bible here on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute, and right over there is, once again, William Bell of All Things Fulfilled. And uh, last week we said, well, okay, we've sort of wrapped this up, but we really hadn't. Uh, the more I thought about it, I thought, you know what, we, we really cannot end our discussion of the Messianic temple slash tabernacle on the subject of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and resurrection. We've got to develop the theme that continues in second Corinthians chapter five. And that's the subject of the, of not only resurrection, not only spirit, but of the new creation. So anyway, William, how you doing this evening? I'm doing very well. Um, just involved in debate preparation, <laughs> trying to, that trying to get, Tell Everything us a little bit in. about that. Yeah, tell us a little bit about it. You're having a debate this Friday evening, so fill in some details. Okay. Well, um, you know, I'm I was just minding my own business, <laughs> <laughs> and then I got a uh, request that uh, this gentleman by the name of Scott Clem um, wanted to debate on the resurrection, uh, whether it's past or fulfilled and i said you know fine if we can keep it around send it around first corinthians 15 and second corinthians 5 because a lot of times you know we never get to that point in some of these discussions that we have when we're talking about uh, the preterist view but anyway it's coming up on friday at 7 p.m central 8 p.m eastern on standing for truth and if you go to uh standing for truth and find that you should be able to find the um uh the uh post on it and you can click on it. And if you click on it, there's a little button that says notify me. So you will actually be notified. They'll send you an email when um, or before the debate starts so you can be prepared for that. But um, we're still, you know, sort of in preparations. I've been waiting um, to get, you know, some of the material back, the ant question, answers to the questions so we can move forward and kind of see what we got to deal with. Uh, it's going to probably be, a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm anticipating a good debate. Uh, Scott seems to be somewhat, you know, informed, you know, or, or quite informed. He's a partial preterist, mm -hmm. uh, by the way. And, um, uh, you know, I was a partial preterist for about six months before I even knew what that was. <laughs> 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 well, that was that was like 40 some years ago. Right. And uh, it didn't take me long to realize that partial preterism wasn't going to work. So, you know, I hopefully uh, we'll be able to move the needle a little bit bit on um, Friday night. But I'm expecting a pretty good challenge, a pretty good discussion, and um, hopefully something that'll be edifying to the audience. And we'll just keep uh, trying to move the needle forward in terms of um, helping other people to understand this. And, you know, we're getting, as you know, a lot of, of um, interest in the view mm -hmm. and uh, people can't ignore it anymore. They're having to talk about it. You know, I was producing, I was filming this morning, one of my now TV videos for next week. And um, it was, as, as I went into the program, I began sharing with people of how in, in the late eighties, early nineties, you and I were speaking at war on Ohio and we would gather together as a group of speakers after the presentations and we would dream, we would we would hash things out and we would say, boy, wouldn't it be cool if there were more than just two preterist books on the market? Well, now there are. And, yeah. and you wrote <laughs> most of them. <laughs> I've written 35. So anyway, uh, but we, you know, we, we would dream and we say, well, one of these days there's going to be preterist radio programs. There are. And we would say, boy, there's going to be preterist television stations. And there are. You're on now TV. I'm on now TV. I don't know of any other preterists that are, but they probably are. Uh, I haven't heard about him if there are, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. uh, it's a good venue that we are allowed on. And, and so the very things that you and I, a long time ago, <laughs> dreamed about, talked about, uh, and envisioned, all of it is happening. And the growth of the preterist movement is such that, as you just stated, uh, the rest of the Christian world can no longer, they can no longer ignore us. And they know that. 
And so in so many instances, as is very sad, uh, you have some people that really honestly, uh, they, they shouldn't even venture to make any comments until they spend another 10 or 15 years studying the Bible. <laughs> I mean, yes, yes. I mean, some of the, some of the comments and some of the quote objections that people throw at us. Uh, and, and I, I don't want to be unkind and I understand that these people are well-intentioned, but they're so asinine, they're so immature, they're so ill-informed, they're so illogical. And this happens to me on a weekly basis of someone that I've never heard of, I've never engaged with, and they throw they throw out this little series of little trite arguments that that you and I and other predators have answered a million times. Oh, yeah. But they think, because they thought of this objection, by <laughs> golly, no, there ain't no predators can answer this. And then when you do answer it, they just literally disappear. Yeah. <laughs> and so we see it over and over and over again. So uh, the bottom line is that the predators movement is growing fast, and, and our opponents recognize that. And they are literally in panic mode. Uh, a real quick example of this, and then we'll move right on into our study this evening. Mm -hmm. about, a, about probably maybe two years ago, there was a Spanish-speaking Facebook page established, Preterista Escatologia. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. I remember the page. Okay. I just, yeah. Well, anyway, name, it, I should say, yeah, it, it started up. I was invited to start posting there by mm -hmm. the uh, admins. I didn't really know the admins. Evidently they were familiar with some of my writings. And so I was very glad. I was very honored to be invited to be a part of that. Well, in approximately two years, I'm going to say approximately two years, time gets away from me, but I think it's about two years. I just noticed this morning that when I posted today's video there, they're up to 1.2 thousand. They're up to 1,200 members. Now, that's wow. that's pretty remarkable. And I, I've noticed that with other. Uh, there's another, uh, basically a preterist Facebook page. I posted on it this morning, and it's entitled Gone Eschaton. If, if, I think that's correct. And, and if I remember their numbers... I may be thinking actually of another page, but I don't think so. This may be it. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it has something like 8,000 members. Mm -hmm. So when, when you have all of these multitudinous Facebook pages established by preterists, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm a member of some Facebook pages that have 20, 30, 40 members. But when they started out, they didn't have any. And these are in foreign countries, you know, the uh, uh, preterist movement in Ghana. They're up to what, 45, 55 members now? Mm -hmm. Started from absolutely scratch, thanks to your work over there. And so it started, it started building, started getting attention. Same thing with the Ethiopian uh, pre preterist page. Th they rocked along, there were two or three members for, for literally months. And now they've started to gain a little bit of steam. So it's so gratifying and, and it's exciting to us to see that kind of movement, but it's certainly troublesome to men like Doug Wilson, who said, speaking of the Predators movement, well, you know, there are only about 14 of those people. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I just got another um, uh, note in my email from a guy that says he's been studying for a while and he's convinced of the Preterist view he just had a couple of questions and that's generally where people get, you know, they get to that point where they just need a couple of questions answered and, um, and that's it. But anyway, go ahead. I just wanted to mention that. Well, you know, I mean, yeah, that. the point you're making there is extremely valid. It happens to me all the time. It's happened to me at least twice this week, emails from people mm -hmm. that says, I'm, I'm basically a full predator. So I've been watching your videos, reading your books and I, I can't, I can't fight it anymore, but here are a few questions for me, for, for you. Yeah, uh, that's great. Uh, once people arrive at the point where, where they're willing to ask legitimate, honest, sincere questions, well, you and I both know basically they're just sunk. 
<laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. They, they will become full printers, even more convinced. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, let's get back into our text that we uh, we looked at last week, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And last week, we spent a good deal of time demonstrating the relationship between the last day's miraculous work of the Holy Spirit and not only the Messianic temple, but resurrection. And let me make this real quick aside, and if William wants to comment on it, uh, certainly hope so. There is an interrelationship, folks, between the Messianic temple and resurrection. Because there is a direct relationship, and I know William will want to comment on this. There is a direct relationship between the Messianic temple and the Messianic kingdom and resurrection. So, William, the door is wide open. Walk okay. through. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> so when you talk about the Messianic kingdom and the resurrection, of course, um, man, where, did, where do you start? You, oh, you I... could start in so many places. <laughs> Let me just start at a very um, uh, obvious place. First Corinthians chapter 15, definitely dealing with the resurrection. And in verse 50, when he speaks about flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, the kingdom in that text is synonymous or at least equivalent in terms of the uh, textual um, position, positioning for the resurrection. And you have to add with that a text like Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, mm -hmm. where it says <laughs> uh, that many would come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom, and Luke's account says, and all the prophets. So there uh, is clearly a reference to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who, according to Hebrews chapter 11, were yet awaiting the entrance into the heavenly city. And now here we have them, uh, according to Matthew 8 and 11, rising to sit down in the kingdom. But when was that to take place? He says, when the Jews would be cast out. And if you could parallel that with Matthew uh, 21 with the parable of the vineyard uh, where the kingdom would be taken from the Jews given to a nation bringing forth fruits thereof and then Galatians 4:30 uh, those who were persecuting the sons of Isaac which was the Jerusalem which was above uh, you have that's that time frame locked in that it was when the old covenant people national Israel was cast out that the resurrection takes place and seeing it as the kingdom, tells us that, you know, the kingdom didn't come with observation, so we can't be looking for some physical body rising up out of the ground. But that's one correlation with uh, the kingdom and uh, and the subject of resurrection. I want to go back to Matthew 8. You know you know that I absolutely, absolutely yeah, I, love I, I saw you. I saw your eyeballs <laughs> light up when I hit them. <laughs> you know, almost came unglued from your seat. <laughs> You know, folks, I, and I've got to tell you, a little book that William Bell wrote, I don't even know how many years ago, uh, might have been even an article, but in the article, he made almost a passing reference to Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, tying it with resurrection. I had been toying with the text. I had not just really focused on it, but the comments that William made just made the fireworks go off in my head. Because what is Matthew chapter 8 and 11 about? Well, first of all, it's obviously about resurrection. How do I know that? Well, because back in Isaiah chapter 25, verse 6 through 8, on this mountain, well, what is that mountain? It's Zion. And a couple of years ago, William and I spent, <laughs> I don't even know how many programs we did investigating the subject of Zion, the eschatological significance and the power of Zion. Okay, so on this mountain, the, the Lord shall make a great feast, a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the, on the leaves. And then what would he do? He will destroy on this mountain the covering that is cast over all the people. He will swallow up death forever. Now look, 99.9% .9 of commentators recognize the Messianic banquet is the time of the resurrection. Okay? So Matthew chapter 8, 11 has Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob setting down at the Messianic banquet, 
which means they're resurrected. That's correct. Oh, wait a minute. If Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have sat down at the Messianic banquet, and by the way, it's absolutely staggering to me the number of commentators, especially post-millennial commentators. Kenneth Gentry goes to Matthew chapter 8, 11, already fulfilled. We are in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're sitting at the feast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Steve Gregg says the Messianic banquet has already been established. He's not post-millennial. He's all millennial. But nonetheless, you, you just find one commentator after another, and, and again, especially post-millennialists, admitting that Matthew chapter 8, 11 is fulfilled. And when do they tell us it was fulfilled? Oh, well, Kenneth Gentry, Gary DeMar, Joel McDermott, with whom I had a two-day formal debate. Most of your leading post-millennialists say, well, well, Matthew chapter 8, verse 11 was fulfilled when the sons of the kingdom were cast out. And they just flat out tell you, that was in AD 70. Okay, let me see. The Messianic kingdom was fully established in AD 70, but the Messianic banquet would be established at the time of the resurrection. Therefore, the resurrection was in AD 70 when the sons of the kingdom were cast out. <laughs> and so what do these guys start doing? Oh, well, Kenneth Gentry has started saying, well, you see, of course, there was a resurrection in AD 70. It was the spiritual transformation from the covenant of death to the covenant, new covenant life of Jesus Christ. You didn't know that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He changed his position on Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Well, I'm aware of that. Yes. And I'm aware of his position on um, uh, John Matthew, 4. Yeah, John, well, yeah. John 4 as well. But anyway, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> well, he has. He he now says that Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 is the spiritual resurrection of Christ by being transformed into the body of Christ in AD 70. Right. But he does he tie that in with Matthew 8? Yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to full preterism, Kenny <laughs> Gentry. <laughs> and and Don, um, you, while you're kind of getting your throat cleared here, uh, just for people to know, I did... Uh, a video on Matthew 8, 11, and 12, where I just kind of walked through several facets of resurrection point after point after point on that. And so I would recommend that if you haven't watched that to go and watch it because it's, it's very powerful. I don't even know what, whether I finished it. I mean, I was just covering so many points, but you could literally take every text on resurrection, walk it right through Matthew 8, 11, and 12. That's and exactly right. It's it's just that powerful. That That's why I said that when you wrote that article or a little book, I've forgotten which it was. It, it had to be an article. Okay. That it just, it just absolutely set the bells and, you know, <laughs> fireworks just going off in my head. And Matthew chapter 8, verse 11 has become one of my very favorite resurrection passages. Oh, it's, yes. I mean, it's just so incredibly, incredibly power, powerful. So in my book, the resurrection of Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, future or fulfilled. I go over a lot of the very points I'm sure that you pointed out in your video or videos, as the case may have been. And I said, now, if it's the case, as these post-millennialists admit, that the resurrection banquet is re uh, the messianic banquet is the resurrection banquet. And if that was fully established in AD 70, that means Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have been resurrected. But I think it's real, real obvious to anybody, is it not? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were not raised out of the dust of the, of the earth and given physical bodies, immortal bodies, to sit at the, as a, at the resurrection banquet in a new creation. Mm, should be pretty obvious. Yeah. Uh, you know, one thing I, I also like about that is when you parallel it with Luke, oh. and it's it's very obvious. <laughs> yeah, Luke 13. Uh, 28 to 33. Yes, and, and you parallel it with that. But uh, the conversation that goes on in the context, Lord, we have, uh, what did he say? We um, followed you, you know. We have, we have eaten in your presence, and you have taught in our streets. Yep. How could that refer to anybody living today? <laughs> 
that Jesus was actually down on, uh, you know, Martin Luther King Boulevard or Broadway or somewhere else teaching the gospel Rain in the streets. No, it, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it just doesn't happen. So all of that evidence is right there. And uh, and then he tells them, you know, depart from me, I never knew you, workers of iniquity. And same text in Matthew 7, et cetera. So uh, the context is just so powerful. And I don't think it gets enough attention. As a matter of fact, um, there was a debate held in Indianapolis some years ago when I went up there to uh, be with Steve and, and um, I think it's uh, uh, Holger and John, is it his name, Walton? John, uh, oh, Watson. Uh, Watson, Watson, yeah. yes. <clears throat> yeah, and and so I think it was John Watson who, who might have been debating. And, and so he did I, have a debate up there a few years ago. Yeah, during the Q&A session, I, sent, I was sitting in the audience and I sent them you know, John, I mean, uh, Matthew 8, 11. And I don't think at the time they were really aware of just how powerful it was. And then after it came down, Hoger came back to to me and I, I kind of explained it to him. And he said, oh, man, wow, what an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's interesting. But I, I think we need to use it a lot more than, than you know, uh, the times that we use it. I know you and I do use it a lot, but I think some of the rest of the guys need to really pull that one out of the hat and just kind of have I, it. I agree a hundred percent. You know, there are certain things. And of course you and I are old timers, especially you, but <clears throat> <laughs> look at his hair, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I got a little black up here. <laughs> yeah. 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 I know. I know. And uh, so anyway, but, through a process of time, we have, and this is not a boast, it's just simply a fact of continual study. You and I have covered more territory because of the time involved than a lot of these younger men. We've got some really, really bright young guys coming up, and it's so oh, exciting yeah. to see. I am really impressed. Yes, absolutely. Me too. Uh, and so this this is not any way to disparage some of the others. And, and to say, well, they ought to pay more attention to this, that, and other. No, it's just simply because William and I happen to have been studying a little longer. We've gone through the process longer than they have. But boy, like I said, we've got some really, really sharp minds coming up and that are already out there that are just really doing a fantastic job. I get, I get bemused on Facebook, especially, and sometimes as well on YouTube in the comment section under my videos that somebody will post, you know, one of these objections and all of a sudden some of these younger predators will chime in and I'm going, I don't have to say anything. <laughs> why, exactly. why do I need to jump in here? These guys are doing a fantastic I love job. when that happens on my YouTube channel. <laughs> somebody asked a question and before I could even get there, somebody's answered it. I mean, and they have given a dynamite response. I know it. I know it. I'm just going, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. I used, we used to hear people say, well, and look, William, you've been asked and I've been asked, okay, what's going to happen when William and Don are gone? And there was a, a, a brief period of time and we're going, Ooh, you know, <laughs> there aren't that many guys out there, but now that's, that's yeah. changed. And it's changed radically to where you just know that preterism is now in really good hands with the, yes. with an upcoming generation. And it's like I said, it's so refreshing. It's so exciting. And it's it's reassuring to know that the preterist movement is just going to keep right on growing because of some of these bright young guys. You know, let's let's face it, we've got some young men in some of the uh, universities of higher education working on the doctorates. These are going to be fully accredited academic people who are full preterist. So it can't, you know. These uh, these skeptics can't throw the claim. Well, you guys are nothing but a bunch of unlearned, you know, keyboard warriors. Yeah. No, no they can't do that anymore. Not with so some of these guys. Do uh -huh. what? So interesting to me. I was just saying, so interesting to me that you know people say that, and then I look at as you were just indicating over the years, where even some of the PhD guys who are out there who weren't seeing the things that we saw years ago but are now beginning to see them write about the, write about them in their books and talk about them in their videos. You know, I, I watched N.T. Wright, not to say that, you know, uh, whether he saw or didn't see things, I do know that he had meetings with Max King back yep. in the day when we were working with him. 
But anyway, um, you know, his videos on the rapture, et cetera, now are saying some things that, you know, I'm now seeing videos pop up saying, oh, there's no more rapture, you know, as a result of some things he's saying. But we've been saying it for years. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and then the other thing is uh, uh, Rod Rupert and I have been kind of having some email discussions. And, uh, and I'm looking at, you know, as you're talking about, you know, what's happening in the future and uh, how bright that is with these, these uh, young men who are coming along today. But I'm sitting back saying, OK, well, we had a work to do and sort of building the foundation, cutting down the trees in the forest so people could kind of see the path. And now that the path is gone, it you know, it, it doesn't take them 40 years, Don. That's right. That's to right. Get to where we are and then move on beyond that. It takes them six months, a couple of years, and they've got their feet planted solidly on, you know, a solid foundation. And man, are they taking off? And I'm just sitting back. OK, now I'm learning from them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why I say it's so exciting and it's so reassuring and it's so comforting to know that things are only going to get better. Mm -hmm. I have, pe I have people contact me very, very often who tell, who just express the idea and to a certain extent, yeah, it's hope, but it's, it's, <clears throat> it's based upon what they're seeing. People say in the next few years, there's going to be a tidal wave of people accepting covenant eschatology. Oh yeah. There's, there's sort of a, you know, even in business, uh, you know, they, and, and uh, memes and, you know, they talk about how thought starts and then it starts to grow. And then it goes through that momentum curve mm -hmm. when it just shoots up all at once. And so eventually the concentration will be as such to where it's just going to explode. Yep. That's exactly right. I know that's not good news to our futurists and dispensational <laughs> friends, but we're just sorry. We're just, yeah, hey, we, yeah. we, we well, can't we're control really that. So, yeah, we're not really very God, sorry. <laughs> God gives the increase. No, we're not. We're quite excited about it. <laughs> okay. Well, in second Corinthians chapter five, as, as we've just said, we have the relationship between the kingdom, the spirit, the resurrection. But we also see that, that it, there is a direct correspondence there with the new creation. Now, very quickly, let me point something out. And, and I developed this extensively. Uh, and I document it from ancient rabbinic writings, from ancient historical writings, scholarly works of all sorts. But in the ancient Jewish narrative, the timeline, if you please, of Jewish eschatology was they believed that in the last days, Elijah would appear. There would be a time of great distress, which is known as the Great Tribulation, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. In the midst of all of that, you would have this man of sin. You would have the judgment. You would have the resurrection at the coming of the Lord to usher in the new creation. Now, that's, that's the basic timeline and, um, and listing of, of elements of Jewish eschatology. And it's easily documented, like I said in my book, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, the resurrection of Daniel chapter 12, I fully document it. So if anyone wants to doubt it, they can go to the book, they can document, get it. Well, guess what, folks? <clears throat> that narrative, that timeline of events is exactly the, the timeline that Jesus and the New Testament writers followed. They laid it out the same way. Now, did they have precisely the same outlook as to the nature of things? Nope, they sure didn't. The Jews were expecting the restoration of a nationalistic Davidic <clears throat> kingdom, a quasi-military, socioeconomic, geopolitical, et cetera, et cetera, kingdom. That was not the kingdom that Jesus came to establish. So the timeline is the same. The narrative is the same. So here's the point. In the narrative, what do you have? <clears throat> you have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You have the resurrection followed by the new creation. What does Paul talk about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5? Resurrection through the Spirit. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, <clears throat> if any man is in Christ, he is new creation. He doesn't say a new creation, doesn't say the. He simply says he is new creation. Folks, commentator after commentator, none of whom are preterists that I'm aware of, 
recognize that what Paul is saying here is that the anticipated new creation foretold by the Old Testament prophets had broken into the old world, the old world being the old world of Israel. And they tell us, well, you've got an overlap of the two ages, of the two worlds, the two <clears throat> kingdoms. But they had a juncture point. And at that juncture, junction point, the old would fully pass, the new would be fully established. It's called the already, but the not yet. So we, why don't you pick it up there? How I mean, how significant is it that in a context of resurrection and spirit and kingdom that Paul's talking about new creation? Well, that is, as you said, you know, when you uh, drew out the timeline, that's exactly, you know, what was to take place. But uh, what's interesting in looking at this new creation, one thing we understand is that it's not a physical creation. It's not a creation that deals with a transformation in the material world, as people are wont to say from Romans chapter 8, etc. Uh, this creation is already broken in in the first century. It's uh, a part of the uh, work of the, that eschatological spirit that's taking place, and that's demonstrating that resurrection is in process it's demonstrating the nature of the new creation and while i hear people as you say and i, I actually saw someone today use the exact same hand crossing <laughs> illustration that you did, you did i was watching them on video to talk about the end breaking of the new creation and yet when they are saying that and looking at the new creation in the new testament and they see that it's spiritual and somehow they want to change it at the consummation into a different nature of creation and then uh, place its arrival totally separate and apart from what was already uh, inaugurated from the beginning. So, uh, you know, that's one thing that I see. Um, it comes as a result of the work of the Spirit. And, uh, you know, there's a text in, in Psalm 102, I think it is, uh, that talks about this, this coming creation that, uh, and what is that? Psalm 102, 25, I want to yeah, say. 25 and 26. Yeah, 25. The old, and, the old creation is growing old and passing away. And so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the idea in, in verse 18, even earlier than that, when he says this will be written for the generation to come that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. And so uh, this is looking forward to that time uh, for the new creation. And, and of course, at that time, uh, you have a world that was passing away at the same time that this new creation is coming in. And that, that's what's indicated in verses 25 and 26. Yeah. And picking up on that concept that, that, <clears throat> that the psalmist was talking about a people that is yet to be created, who's mm -hmm. Paul talking about? And two, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the new creation of a new body, as he expresses in Ephesians chapter 2, at one time you were called Gentiles, being called known as the circumcision or uncircumcision. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are far off are made nigh through the blood of Christ or through the body of Christ. He is made of two, one new man, having broken down the wall of petition that was between us, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so I'm, you know, citing several verses there in Ephesians, from Ephesians 2, 11 and following. But the point of it is, here's the new, new people that is being created. God was taking the righteous remnant of old covenant Israel, bringing in the Gentiles and joining them together to create this new people with, oh, by the way, a new name. And this again, this concept of this already breaking into that old covenant world it is something that many, many scholars recognize. And yet, as you well pointed out, they want to extrapolate the full arrival of the new creation instead of seeing that the new creation is a creation of fellowship. It's not a creation of atoms and biological substance focused on those things. It is a new creation based upon, number one, as Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1, 9 through 11, that before the beginning of time, God purposed, God predetermined 
that in the dispensation or the stewardship of the fullness of time, he would gather together all things, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in one body in Christ. So what's the goal of the new creation? Reunification of heaven and earth. That's fellowship restoration. Mm -hmm. That's not biological restoration. And that, that's the whole story that we get when we look at the story of eschatology. That And you made a comment just recently that people want to, when they come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, they want to talk about physical bodies. And yet 1 Corinthians 15 is about, about Christ dying for our sin. So they shift the focus from spiritual realities to biological realities, from spiritual hope <clears throat> to biological hope. And it completely shifts the focus of 1 Corinthians 15. Yes, it does. You know, um, back to this idea of the new creation, as he's saying, uh, in Christ, they are new creation. Well, think about that for a moment. Um, new creation has to be equivalent to resurrection. And what we have in, let's say, John 11, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And since you're talking about relationship, that it's the joining together of Jew and Gentile into this one body, creating this new people, that's letting us know that Christ is the new creation as well. So we should think of these terms in relationship to Christ from that perspective. And, and certainly that can't be. Um, and, and, you know, we've been on the subject of the temple. Christ is the temple, you know, uh, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. So that's the, that's the new uh, heavenly temple, but he's also the new creation. He's the resurrection. And so all of this is about, as you say, relationship to God, and it's showing that spiritual relationship. You, you have, for example, in Romans one, where it says Christ was born according to the flesh of the seed of David. That's his old covenant relationship when he came born of a woman, born under the law. But he was declared to be the son of God with power. So here is a whole different Christ in terms of his stance before God, his relationship, his covenantal uh, existence and, and status, uh, which had nothing to do with the change of his physicality. He had the same body. It was flesh and bone. He ate broiled fish and honeycomb, et cetera, that didn't change. But his status, covenantal status, being under that under the law and then dying to that, making his exodus out of that, entering into uh, as the firstborn from the dead to, into this new realm, uh, according to the spirit, that's where he's declared the son of God. And that's where he leads others to become sons of God in that realm without having to change their biological makeup, as you've been saying. You know, <clears throat> pardon me, it's absolutely fascinating to me, and it's to be expected, when futurists put all of their emphasis on the, the biological substance, and they put all of their emphasis, and they make a couple of assumptions. They, they, they say, well, in 1 Corinthians 15, we're, we're told that Christ was raised immortal and incorruptible. I want you to address that here momentarily. But then, of course, they say, and they extrapolate, and they say, well, just as Christ was raised immortal and incorruptible <clears throat> out of the natural body into the spiritual body, they say, we have to be raised from out of the natural body into the spiritual body. But again, this gets back to the kingdom. Flesh and blood, in other words, the natural man, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. <clears throat> I go back to the fact that Steve Gregg said, the natural man is what is put into the dirt. He said that, says that in his book, <clears throat> pardon me, on uh, why not full preterism. Well, I'm assuming that your opponent would take the, t the same identical position. The he natural does. man is the mortal man. It's the mortal body. It's the corruptible body. There's a real serious, well, there's lots of them, but there's a real, real serious problem here. If the natural man, if the mortal man cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven, 
then that means that nobody gets to enter the kingdom of heaven until the end of time because we're all in, quote, natural mortal bodies. We're in bodies of flesh and blood. <clears throat> but of course, you and I would take the position. Paul's reference to flesh and blood is not talking about this stuff right here. He's not talking about a tissue issue, as one former preterist used to say. Well, he was absolutely right on that. Paul's not focused on a tissue issue. He's not saying flesh and blood cannot enter the heaven. If he was, he was contradicting himself because in Colossians chapter 1, writing to living, breathing human beings, he said, God has translated us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. Did you turn yourself off or did I just lose you? I don't know what happened there. All of a sudden, William is not there. No, Hopefully. I'm still here. I, I, I had to um, okay. grab some water, man. My throat's dry. <laughs> so can okay. Be, I so, forgot to drink some water before we started. Yeah, yeah. So anytime and every time <clears throat> that futurists focus on the biological substance of Jesus' resurrection. Make no mistake, folks, William and I both firmly believe, 100% believe, that Jesus was raised physically from the dead. But That's William, true. was Christ, and this, this gets really down to the crux uh, of futurism in many, many ways, was Christ's post-resurrection, pre-ascension body, his immortal, incorruptible body. Because that, as I said, that whole, in a lot of ways, is the foundation of their entire argument on 1 Corinthians 15? It is not. Um, <clears throat> if people are going to argue that they're going to be raised in the same kind of body that Jesus, Jesus was raised in, first of all, they got problems because his body saw no decay. So they're trying to use a resurrection paradigm or um, um, concept of comparing a body that saw no corruption to bodies that do corrupt. Here's the other thing. Um, the Bible uses a term for a dead corpse. You can see it in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 8. It's the word potoma in the Greek. I want to say the Hebrew equivalent is gamea. Uh, I might have mispronounced that, but it's there. You can check it out. But that word's never used in 1 Corinthians 15. <laughs> With all the talk of a body, it's not used. And even when Paul talks about the um, Adam becoming a living being, a living suke, that's a living suke. It's not a dead one. It's not a corpse. Right. So the contrast between the two Adams is not dead physical bodies. And so the, the um, idea of Jesus's body is not what is used to determine what is corruptible, incorruptible, and uh, perishable or imperishable or undying. That's not his contrast in ter terms of his physical body. And it's not the contrast that he makes with believers. As a matter of fact, um, I have gone through and looked at just about every verse in 1 Corinthians 15 to demonstrate how none of them could refer to a physical body. And in looking at First Corinthians fifteen, you you uh, here's here's a problem with that whole whole approach. It's they fail to define resurrection, just like you and I have been corresponding. And your debate opponent that you've got coming up <laughs> uh, defined resurrection, and he defined it as though the term body is a part of the word, and it is not. No. And that's one of the problems that people have when they go to it. They just bring this assumption uh, that's in there. But um, what the scripture is talking about, when it talks about an incorruptible um, body, it's talking about um, Christ and his spiritual body, the one that we were just covering being raised from the dead, the kingdom, the incorruptible uh, kingdom, um, the uh, spiritual body of Christ, which is a corporate entity and not uh, his physical, biological body. And that's, you know, where the distinction comes up. And that's that that new man that you were talking about from Colossians 3, 9, in comparison to the old man who was corrupt according to the deceitful lust. 
and the new man who is created in righteousness and true true holiness. So this is uh, the difference. These are corporate concepts. These are covenantal concepts. And that's the difference between the old man and the new man, the corruptible man and the incorruptible man. You touched on something. I, I want to lay something out on the table, and I want I want your response to this. <clears throat> we are told, well, the first man, Adam, was of the dust, earthy. The second man is heavenly. But William, wasn't Christ created, or was he not likewise of the dust, being a mortal Physical. man? Physically speaking, he was. Physically speaking, he's of the dust. So it's not a contrast between dust versus dust. It can't be. It's of the nature of Adam. When you look at the term dust in the Old Testament, and by the way, you find this in Isaiah 25, 26, resurrection text from which Paul is drawing in 1 Corinthians 15. What does Isaiah say? God has brought down the nations to the dust. Well, is he talking about biological destruction? No, he's defeated them. And he looks at Israel. And he's talking about Israel being in the dust. Well, why was he talking about Israel being in the dust? Because Israel was being oppressed, had been defeated, and being oppressed by the conquerors. But the nation, pardon me, the nation was still alive biologically. The individuals within the nation were still very much alive. And by the way, it's really, really interesting to me that Eric Macher, uh, in his commentary on Isaiah, pardon me, makes some extremely important and insightful comments. He goes to Isaiah 24 and 25, and he, he sees that the Hebrew speaks about the shame and the glory and the covering and the death. And he makes the observation, the author of Isaiah 24 and 25 is not talking about some generic death as if it's death broadly considered. It is a very specific death that he has in view. Well, I wonder what that death might, the death might be. Well, according to Isaiah chapter 24, the earth is clean, broken up. Destruction of the creation. Why? Because they have violated the everlasting covenant. Isaiah 24, verse 5. What happened to Israel when she violated the covenant? Ah, she died. Pure and simple, she died. Hosea chapter 13, verse 1. When Israel humbled himself, she was exalted. When Ephraim sinned, he died. Yet he sinned more and more. Uh, how do biologically dead people keep on sinning? See, folks, this is all about relational. My point being that Isaiah is using dust, not in the biological sense, not in the earthly physical sense, when he's talking about <clears throat> the resurrection being raised out of the dust. And I should also point out a growing number of scholars are recognizing that in Isaiah chapter 26, when he's talking about the resurrection, it's talking about national resurrection of Israel, the corporate body of Israel. Now, he uses the same term, uh, your dead bodies, plural, along with my body shall rise. Well, that's because it's the corporate and the individuals are, in corp are involved in the corporate. Just exactly like Ezekiel chapter 37, here's the whole house of Israel that are in their graves. It's the nation in the grave. Singular grave, people in the graves of captivity. And yet God's saying, I'm going to raise you up out of your graves. That's national restoration. And I've pointed this out before, but John Levinson, a book you're familiar with as well, admits that historically, in ancient times, Isaiah 26, Ezekiel 37, those were taken to speak of the restoration of Israel as a nation, to return to God. They were not even interpreted as predictions of physical resurrection. Well, neither was Hosea. So 
once again, back to Isaiah chapter 24, 25, 26, you have these references to the dust. Well, then in Isaiah chapter 29, God says that he was going to come against Israel, and he said, I will bring you low, and you shall speak out of the dust. Yes. I want to come in on some of that a little bit as well. I don't know. Uh, I think I knocked my camera off by accident. Yeah, you did. Then. Go ahead. M must have hit a key. All right. In Ezekiel 16, when God finds Israel, where are they? Mm -hmm. They're in the field. Yep. <laughs> that's that's another reference to ground or dust. Mm -hmm. And then when he passes by them, he passed by them and said, live. So he's calling them up out of the dust. Now, I find it interesting that the reference that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 45, when he says the first man, Adam, was made a living being, he's drawing from Genesis 2 and verse 7. Correct. And that text says Adam was formed Out of from the dust. the dust, and God breathed into him, and he became a living soul, or suke mm -hmm. is, is the term, or nephesh is the Hebrew word. Now, think about that with Ezekiel, as you've just commented. Here they are in the Valley of Dry Bones, and what does God say? I'm going to, or, you know, he's going to breathe on them, right? Mm -hmm. And then they will come to life. So this concept is flowing all the way through Scripture from that, uh, from that perspective of dust. And then Daniel as well, many of those who sleep where? In the dust of the earth. So um, it's very consistent. And, and one thing I like to point out, and you know, some a couple of years ago when I was preparing for a debate with Michael Holloway, I created this chart of all these references in the Old Testament that you and I are just speaking about with Israel dwelling in the dust, national um, uh, captivity and national deliverance, uh, showing the correlations between all of them. And then what, what do you have in 1 Corinthians 15? The very same concept, but who are we dealing with? We are dealing with national Israel, the sons according to the flesh, and the sons according to the spirit. And he's talking about those who dwell in the dust, who were in Adam, who were in Moses, and therefore raising them out into uh, into Christ or raising them into Christ, who is the, the, the life-giving spirit. So it's the same concept all the way through. And because we approach the text with these 21st century eyes, looking past the first century, the time statements and the time frame, and looking past the, the culture and um, the, um, uh, you know, the genre and nomenclature of scripture as it relates to these Hebrew concepts, we wind up trying to force physicality into the text, and it just doesn't work. And I'll tell you another thing I like, and I know you got to be excited about it, and while I'm saying it, let me uh, remind you, uh, or at least mention it to you, because I've been intending to do it. Send me copies of both your books with 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 the uh, uh, bill, and I will send you the check for uh, your new books on all things, and what's the other one? All on things the fulfilled in Sukkot? Yeah, yeah, okay. send, send those to me, and I because I need to get them. But anyway, and that's the other thing about it, is they remove the resurrection. And one thing I, I, I'm really excited about, and that is how you can pretty much lay out. And I, did you do that in your book? I, did you lay out First Corinthians 15 with the feast days in the book? Oh, yeah, I, I definitely touched on it. Oh, you okay, bet. Very good. Yeah. Very good. And that's another powerful concept. And that's also why uh, people can't understand what's going on with that. But that dust versus raising them into the realm of the spirit concept or the heavenly uh, is a um, very, very important concept of uh, well first uh, and a, to go back to a point that i mentioned a, a few moments ago that just hit me relatively recently i don't know why but when you talk about this issue of dust first man adam was of the dust the second man is of, of heaven but insofar as creation is concerned and in, insofar as uh the the human existence is current concerned both are from the dust so paul's contrast is not not between biolog biological substance. It is the nature of the existence. Adam violated God's law. Thus, he was truly of the dust in that sense. Now, yes, he was created of the 
physical dust outside the garden, the point that you made a moment ago. That's very true. But he also became a man of the dust by sitting and thus bringing shame on himself and dishonor upon himself versus Christ, the man from heaven, who is a life-giving spirit. Why? Because he did no sin. But both are of the dust in one sense. Yes. But you cannot focus on that biological substance as the focus of Paul, or else you wind up with all sorts of problems. Which one is truly of the dust? Well, both are. Okay, yeah, if they're both of the dust, then wh where's the contrast there? Mode of existence. A and to drive this home, you were mentioning a few moments ago the fact about the, corrupt the corruptible man. Well, the corruptible man is the natural man. Sometime back, I did a study on Phthora and Ophthora, uh, the words that are used for corruption or incorruption. And what's absolutely amazing to me is in the great preponderance of, of passages in which Phthora is used, it is absolutely not used of biological corruption, of a body decaying away or being subject even to physical decay. Phthora has to do with moral corruption. Exactly. And so here is Paul in a context saying, well, if, uh, if Christ is not raised, you're still in your sin. Oh, you're still in corruption. You are in the world that is corrupt through wicked desires, 2 Second, Second Timothy chapter 2. And so, and, and you know, Peter says, you have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, they've escaped corruption? Then they're already immortal, <laughs> Accor <laughs> according, according to the way people are using the word corruption in 1 Corinthians 15. Well, put both 1 Peter 1, 23 with 2 Peter 1, 3. Absolutely. And 4. Yes. And th there you have it. Yes. They're absolutely. born again, not of corruptible seed. seed or corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. And then here we have in 2 Peter, he says they have escaped the corruption. As a matter of fact, there are so many parallels between 1 and 2 Peter related to these oh, concepts absolutely. Absolutely. that uh, people need to look at. But yeah, that's... That's it. They've escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. And what does John say in 1 John uh, 2, 15? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the world, but is of the Father. And then he, and, and he says, and the world, that cosmos was passing away, but he who does the will of God would abide forever. And then you can couple that with the term age where Demas have forsaken me, Paul said, having love this present age. So you've got the age and the cosmos, and Ephesians 2 puts them together, the age of this cosmos. So he's dealing with that age uh, in, in that particular um, first century that was coming to its end in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, the end of the ages have come upon us. So uh, that was- and, and to drive home that point even a little bit more, <clears throat> it's not only the end of that age, of the previous ages that was had come upon them, it's the Greek word telos, which carries the connotation not only of end, but of goal. Yes. Paul is saying that the goal of all the previous ages, and I think he's using heterosis there personally. I do too. I do. <laughs> yeah. But the point being, the goal of all past time, the goal of all the previous ages was coming upon them. Well, that kind of violates the dispensational view. It violates the all-millennial view. It violates the post-millennial view. It violates any futurist view because they tell us, well, yeah, you know, what was happening in the first century was sort of kind of cool and neat and all that kind of stuff, but we're really waiting for the real goal. And the real goal somehow, some way is the end of time. And physical bodies that have been transformed into some kind of incorruptible dirt. That's not Paul's concept. It's not. It's not. And uh, and the other thing about it is, um, you know, when you talk about those bodies in 1 Corinthians 15, or you talk about the body because it's not the bodies, right. uh, but you look at the concept there, uh, it's an action that was presently going on. And if that is the case, then... They have to show us if they're going to argue and, and admit that, uh, like some do, the resurrection had already begun, uh, yet they say in the spirit, which reverses Paul's <laughs> natural versus spiritual concept of verse 46. 
Uh, but if that is true, that resurrection is taking place and it's physical resurrection, if that's what they're going to argue, because the language says that this was already underway, show us the body. The obligation is on you to produce that physical body. Don't just point to Christ's body, because that's not the only one that he's talking about in the text. He's talking about raising the dead ones. And if you are claiming that that's physical bodies, then you have to show us where some physical bodies were raised. There are some physical bodies raised in the New Testament, but they all died. Yeah. And driving that home and we're out of time, but let's go back to the, uh, and folks, William produced a chart not long ago that's absolutely fantastic between resurrection and kingdom. Okay. But to, to address the point that William just raised, and that is that Paul uses the present passive indicatives in 1 Corinthians 15 some 10 or 11 times. And or middle sometimes well, or, or as the well, middle. which 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 has um, another kind of but anyway, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. But the point being, Paul is definitely speaking about an ongoing, then present resurrection. People scoff at the idea. They say, oh no, no, it couldn't be, could not be the same. But wait a minute. When you see the correlation between resurrection, present passive, present middle, or even present active indicative and you see the correlation with the kingdom what did the writer of hebrews say hebrews chapter 12 verse 28 28 wherefore we receiving that's in the present participial form well we are told participles don't carry the idea of time well, well they certainly do denote time and action a, a type of action and it was a present action so resurrection was ongoing Kingdom was ongoing. Reception of kingdom, reception of resurrection are both present passive indicatives in the New Testament. And William, we're out of time. Guess what? We got to continue this next week on the new creation. All right. All right, man. Good night. Enjoyed it a lot. Uh, Folks, thanks for uh, joining us here on Two Guys in the Bible, a voice on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust. And with that, I'm going to say good night. God bless. I'm going to go right. watch The Mystery of Blind Frog. <laughs> so, something like that. Okay. I love that stuff. Okay. All <laughs> good right. Night. Okay. Good night. All right. Let me see. How, there's something I was going to throw by you. Oh, man, alive. Anyway, whatever. Okay. Talk to you later, my friend. Okay. Bye -bye. Send me an email if you think about it. Send you an email.